the report in your hands really is a result of a project that was launched back in April of uh, 2010. Um, to take a close look at the labs as Steve has laid out for you. Now, though these labs are really not widely known outside maybe this room and, and, a, and a few people in the, uh, with a, a real interest in this, they really sit at the intersection of health and security. And that's a topic that's obviously of interest to most folks in this room, but clear, particularly with CSIS and the work that they've done on smart power, uh, Steve's commission that really looked at the smart global health policy. Um, these laboratories have made sustained contributions in this area of global health and really U.S. national security interests on a relatively small budget. So that uh, when you start looking at that, they're particularly intriguing as one of the best buys in a time of what we all know as fiscal austerity. Uh, we look not only to catalog the strengths, but also to identify what challenges they might have and look to the future and try to make some recommendations that might help us move them in that direction. Um, these labs have been around for a while. Thailand since 1959, Kenya since 1969, Egypt since 1946, Peru since 1983. And you ask, well, what has enabled their longevity? And I think one of the answers is that they have become locally relevant and locally valued, while at the same time they have produced benefits for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. Um, they deal with diseases that have a profound local impact. And so they are seen locally as organizations that are legitimate and useful institutions. Ultimately, these Army and Navy labs serve our service members. And as we care about our service members, we are obligated to care about these labs as well. Uh, in serving the military, this research also produces drugs and vaccines that serve a role um, that serve really the health of all people around the world, and particularly, you know, it targets the world's poor. And so that plays a role in our overall global health uh, interests as a nation. Uh, and it is the importance of all these things coming together that really, uh, I think, underscores the importance of and our interest in pursuing this study of our overseas labs. We, we investigate infectious diseases, endemic diseases that are of importance to the host country, but also that are a threat to our troops. And so uh, it's, a, it's a balance where we, uh, we take young scientists uh, overseas and uh, uh, students and medical professionals and train them alongside us because you know the United States for the longest time has been one of the leaders in science and technology so we've shared that with these countries and they've grown we've uh, you know if you to use a naval analogy we floated their boats along with us and so they've risen to the occasion some of them have went on and taken great jobs in American industry <laughs> And so they've benefited, the country as, as a whole has benefited. So our, our efforts over there uh, as a force protection measure to protect our troops has also benefited the host country. Um, and, you know, uh, we do a lot of uh, public health surveillance now, and that surveillance uh, involves uh, bringing in the host country social workers and uh, epidemiologists and others and they get trained according to our standards and so they go out and they improve their host comfort, uh, country infrastructure. As you mentioned in the outset, uh, our force health protection mission is an important one. In fact, it's one of our key drivers, our medical research and development programs in support of our force health protection requirements is paramount and that requires key subject matter expertise in place in these countries around the world. That coupled with our, our emerging and developing uh, disease detection mission really puts us in a unique opportunity to be able to be responsive and adaptive to new and emerging disease threats. Some good examples over time are out there such as responses and research programs related to cholera, uh, leishmaniasis, trypanosomiasis, more recently Rift Valley fever, uh, drug resistant malaria, and influenza around the world. Um, these are all very key programs that over time have morphed uh, in response to, to new and, and emerging threats. And I think the impact is threefold. Number one, we get actionable data that comes back to the DOD. It informs our medical decision makers having to do with formulating threat matrices, having to do with disease threats for deployments. In addition, this information is also provided back to our host nation public health agencies. 
It's an incredible resource for them. Number two, uh, data of this type also feeds into the larger global public health enterprise, if you will, whether it's WHO and others. And so it, it, it's a much bigger, uh, much bigger impact. And number three, um, this, this very data, this responsiveness, this adaptiveness to new, new threats, new disease, diseases that have been identified, feeds back to our research programs in general, helps uh, optimize them, it helps change them over time, and, and in, in some cases may develop new programs responsive to newly identified military medical threats. So in the end, everyone wins. The military wins, it meets our force health protection uh, mission, the host nation wins, the global health uh, effort wins, and so it, it, it's very good for all concerned. One of the things that medical research units have been very good at is helping us orchestrate and coordinate the various review processes so that the studies that are being done are the best they can be scientifically and stand up to the most rigorous uh, scrutiny uh, with regards to the ethical conduct of a clinical trial. Uh, finally, I want to say that the, the medical research units cannot maintain their, their positions. The world is changing, like you said. The medical research units actually have to stay on the cutting edge that they have been experiencing in the last several years. And it's paramount to their continued success. Now, I think there are aspects we haven't talked about in terms of the impact of the program, certainly as I saw it from the perspective of an ambassador, uh, the impact it has on the economy and, and the infrastructure. I mean, we have built uh, world-class facilities there. We've put world-class equipment into those facilities. Uh, we have made Kenya, uh, it is part of Kenya's regional leadership uh, as a result of what we've done just on this program, not to mention the broader relationship, over 800 technicians claim, uh, trained uh, from the region, from Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Um, and that's appreciated, I think, uh, by the Kenyans. And institution building. Uh, we look at a climate in Kenya where Clearly, there's a culture of impunity. It's not, that's not an overstatement. And within that, to have an institution which is populated primarily by Kenyans with a small uh, a degree of U.S. leadership, uh, promoting the values, institutional transparency and accountability, uh, that's a very important dimension uh, of, of, of the program, though not strictly related to the, uh, to the medical. You know, the, the report uh, that uh, CSIS has pub published challenges us along, uh, I think, uh, at least three significant lines. Um, as noted already, there's this imperative we have to uh, better communicate the value of research laboratories to the nation um, and that it's a shared responsibility. Now, you know, value, uh, you can roughly say, is uh, cost over benefit. And so the issue is we've got to constantly put that out in front of everyone um, that for relatively uh, little dollars, uh, we get a huge benefit, not only in terms of protecting uh, the citizenry of this nation uh, and military folks in uh, specific, but uh, the additive value to the world is just uh, incredible. And important, again, is getting back to this notion of uh, strategic health engagement and building popula uh, healthy populations and preventing disease. So the military research labs around the world aren't purely an army or navy asset. Uh, they're not uh, essentially just a DOD asset or even just a federal government asset. Uh, they really are an asset uh, in the fullest sen sense, um, uh, a real national investment in a national treasure uh, that benefits every man, woman, and child in this country and benefit many people around the world. Mm -hmm.